Well, colleagues, it's just after six, so uh, we'll begin. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, been the easiest uh, time in the United Kingdom, uh, and your presence is greatly appreciated. So I'm Ed Byrne, the President and Principal of King's, uh, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you all uh, for the second lecture in this, the third series of our King's Lectures entitled The Biomedical and Health Revolution. Uh, this lecture series, I think, is now the major lecture series uh, in our annual cycle uh, at King's. Uh, and we've been fortunate to have wonderful people uh, give the lectures in the past, and this year is no exception. One advantage of a trilogy of lectures is you can develop the theme over three lectures, hence our subtitle, A Theme in Three Acts. Um, and this enables us to hold the lectures at different campuses. So we're therefore delighted to see uh, a good attendance at Denmark Hill uh, this evening. Uh, our immensely distinguished speaker for our third series is, of course, Sir Robert Leckler, uh, a great friend of many of us, uh, Senior Vice President, Provost Health, uh, Executive Director of King's Health Partners Academic Health Science Centre, which is, in fact, Robert's creation, uh, and President, current President of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Uh, it's also uh, great to see uh, Giovanna here uh, and uh, one of Robert's daughters, uh, Susanna. Good to see you. Uh, so those of you who attended Robert's absolutely fantastic first lecture at New Hunts House, looking back, learnings from 10 advantages that changed the world, and Robert did give the audience uh, the opportunity to agree or disagree with the 10 uh, seminal uh, events that he'd chosen. Uh, you, like me, will be anticipating another uh, absolutely special uh, uh, occasion tonight. Um, the concept in the King's Lectures, uh, like the Wreath Lectures from the uh, BBC, is one of allowing time in which a most distinguished lec lecturer can develop arguments uh, with a unifying theme beyond that possible in a single lecture. So in the first lecture, Robert examined 10 key advances from the past uh, and drew lessons for the future. Uh, tonight, he will review progress and pitfalls in a lecture with the intriguing title, Looking In, uh, the good, the not so good, and the questionable. So please join me in welcoming our speaker uh, for the second time in this series, uh, the 2020 series of King's Lectures, Professor Sir Robert Leckler. Robert. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ed, for that introduction. Uh, and as I said last time, it's genuinely an honor to be asked to uh, give this series of lectures at King's. Um, and as Ed has pointed out, for those of you that were at the last talk, I uh, did look back at 10 advances that have changed the world and in aggregate have contributed to the doubling in life expectancy that the human race has enjoyed in the last century, a quite extraordinary achievement. And that talk was really meant to be a mood enhancing talk. And for those of you that were there, I hope it did enhance your mood. I did say that the talks would become a little more challenging as they progressed. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll notice that this evening. But what I want to do this evening is start off by uh, exploring with you some of the fields of biomedical research that I think are going to change the face of medicine in the coming decade or two. Uh, and I will, where appropriate, highlight where King's uh, is contributing to these fields of research, and I'm pleased to say that that uh, is true in many instances. And then I will uh, look back and see where things in the research world have sometimes gone wrong and see what lessons we can learn from that, lessons that I will argue we absolutely must heed if we wish to succeed. So as I said last time, and I'm sure is clear to all of you, we are enjoying an unprecedented period of discovery uh, in the field of biomedicine. And it's moving at an extraordinary pace and an accelerating pace. It's sometimes driven by new technologies that allow uh, new things to be uncovered and unpicked. Sometimes it's breakthroughs in understanding the causation of disease. 
And it is often due to an increasing crosstalk between disciplines. And that's something that I think is going to be very important going forward. It's something we're very committed to here at King's because most major challenges in any sphere, I would say, but certainly true in the biomedical sphere, need disciplines within and without biomedicine if we're going to effectively address them. I think it's fair to say we're on the verge of major advances in the treatment uh, of many previously intractable diseases, and I would even dare to say that we're on the brink of some curative therapies, and that is the ambition that we must have. So medicine cures very little, I'm depressed to tell you. We cure infectious diseases, but very, other, very few other things do we cure. But I think we are on track to develop curative therapies. And in diagnostic terms, again, we're seeing a revolution, allowing early detection, which is so important if you want to really effectively arrest disease process, uh, and combining artificial intelligence with advanced imaging, as I'll come to in a moment, is really important. But then uh, we do face some challenges, uh, which I'll come to in the second or the, th the final third of the talk. So let's start with... Um, where advances are being made. And, and here, here's a bridge slide with my last talk, because I showed you the same slide uh, in the last talk. <clears throat> it just illustrates uh, the extraordinary pace at which the scientific community globally can unpick a complex problem when they turn collectively their minds to it. And this was unpicking uh, the complex problem of HIV. Um, and the HIV epidemic, I'm sure you'll remember, it hit in the early 1980s, starting off in California and then rapidly became a global issue. And uh, at that time, a diagnosis of HIV, HIV was effectively a death sentence. There were no grounds for hope. And the molecular biology of the virus was then unpicked over the following few years um, and that allowed intelligent drugs to be designed that interfered with all stages of the viral life cycle, interfering with the binding of the virus to the target CD4 T cell, interfering with the reverse transcription of the viral RNA into DNA, interfering with the integration of that DNA into the host genome, and then interfering with the budding off of new virus particles to go and infect another cell. And it was the combination of several drugs that blocked several stages of that viral life cycle that proved so effective. And so now we can celebrate the fact that a 20-year-old with a high CD4 T cell count after one year of therapy can expect pretty much a normal lifespan. And that is a most dramatic uh, and wonderful achievement. The Ebola vaccine is another illustration of how rapidly uh, we can progress when under pressure. Now, the Ebola issue has particular resonance for us here because, as many of you will know, <coughs> King's Health Partners sent a small team to Freetown, Sierra Leone, nine months before the virus came. And of course, we weren't smart enough to know Ebola was coming. Uh, and that small team, led by Oliver Johnson, did an outstanding job in coordinating a multi-agency effort to contain that epidemic with great courage and great skill. It's a horrible uh, infection with a mortality rate of 50%. Um, but they did a great job. But within five years, there was a vaccine approved by the FDA, uh, which is now in use. And I would dare to predict that this timescale will be even further shortened in dealing with the current challenge and crisis that we're facing with coronavirus. So here are six fields that I'm going to dip into, and don't lose heart, I won't dwell on any one uh, of these for very long. Six fields where I think there are exciting discoveries being made that are going to change uh, the world moving forward. And I'm going to start off um, with my own sort of territory, manipulating the immune system. It's become a very powerful opportunity for new therapies in two major fields. One is cancer, and the challenge in cancer is to persuade the immune system to attack something it's inclined to ignore. The other side of the coin is transplantation and autoimmunity, my own field, where you're trying to persuade the immune system to ignore something it's inclined to attack. So these are two sides of the same coin, but proving very fertile therapy territories. So in cancer, some of the progress has come from the discovery that the immune system has built within it brakes, like any good car. And uh, those brakes are probably designed to limit collateral damage when you make an immune response against an infection. Uh, 
these are called checkpoint inhibitors, and they were discovered by Jim Allison and, and Honjo, and they got the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 2018, because these have proved to be extremely important therapeutic targets to unleash the immune system to attack cancer. Take the brakes off and allow the immune system to do what you wish it to do. Here's a schematic of how this works. So here is a T cell. These are the cells that can kill other cells. They kill virus-infected cells, for example, and they can kill cancer cells. And they recognize a cancer cell through their T cell receptor. But here are the breaks. It's a molecular interaction between PDL1 on the tumor cell and PD1 on the T cell. And when these interact, the T cell gets calmed down and quiet and the brakes are on. Other people call it a don't eat me signal uh, put out by the cancer cell. But if you can block this interaction with uh, biologics such as antibodies, then you, as I say, you release this T cell to do its work and kill the tumor cell. And this slide shows you the number of trials, clinical trials that are going on comparing just 2017 and 2018. So for each of these uh, reagents, there are two columns just showing the increase, even in that uh, recent time period. And each of these is a monoclonal antibody directed against one of those checkpoint inhibitors. Over here, this makes the point that as in HIV, very often it's combination therapy that proves most effective. So this is using one of these checkpoint inhibitor reagents with another immunotherapeutic reagent. The size of the circle reflects the number of trials combining those particular therapies. This was one of the first on the scene, pembrolizumab, uh, and this is very effective in advanced melanoma, and a high-profile figure who benefited from that was Jimmy Carter, the ex-president of the United States, who had advanced melanoma, maybe related to his time on his peanut farm in his youth, um, and he had uh, secondaries in the brain and the liver, and those secondaries disappeared when he was treated with this checkpoint inhibitor. And in the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, uh, shortly after that was publicized, a lot of patients were saying to their doctors, I want what Jimmy Carter had, the president's drug. That reflects patient power in the US that's more potent than here. Now, another approach in cancer that is also proving very effective is uh, adding to the armory of T cells to make them more effective. And this is called uh, putting chimeric antigen receptors onto T cells, known as CAR T cells. Um, and the basic approach is to isolate these T cells, which are capable of killing other cells from a patient, uh, to introduce a gene through a viral vector that leads to the expression on the T cell of these chimeric antigen receptors. And these receptors have two functions. They target the T cells to the cancer. So you put in a receptor specific for the cancer you want to kill. And when they find their cancer, those receptors also activate the T cells to turn them into uh, really fully armed killer cells. And then you infuse those back into the patient. And the results uh, have been extremely gratifying, and it's transforming outcomes in a number of cancers, uh, including uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children with 90% response rates, uh, non-small non cell lung cancer, a horrible cancer to get, 50% of patients respond. When I say respond, either their tumors shrink or at least they stop growing. So these are really dramatic uh, developments. There are still, of course, challenges yet to be solved. These, this approach of the CAR T cells has been much more effective with liquid tumors, so blood cancers, uh, much less success in solid tumors, but I'm pleased to tell you that up at Guy's, there's a group led by John Mayer, uh, working with a particular population of T cells called gamma, gamma delta cells with these CAR receptors. The company's just been spun out from that work called Lucid Bio, and he's having very promising results uh, in solid head and neck cancers. So this is showing you the number of trials involving these gene-modified T cells. And again, you can see this is rising very fast. Uh, and these are different kinds of T cells with these chimeric antigen receptors. Uh, 2019, it's simply a small scale because the data weren't completed for that year. The other side of the coin that I mentioned, um, the other way to manipulate the immune system for the benefit of patients is when you want to turn the immune system off in the context of transplantation and autoimmunity. So another mechanism the immune system has to limit collateral damage is a population, a specialized, specialized population of white blood cells called regulatory T cells. 
They were discovered in the late 90s by Shimon Sakaguchi uh, in uh, Kyoto in Japan. Um, and it turns out that the purpose of these cells is to protect you from autoimmunity. And that is now very well established. So if you engineer a mouse that lacks these cells, and you can do that by knocking out a key gene that's responsible for their function, those mice get multiple autoimmune diseases. And then there are some human families that have been studied, which are the results of consanguineous marriages. And the children uh, of those families, some of them have knockouts in that same gene responsible for the function of these cells. And those children get multiple autoimmune diseases. So these cells, these regulatory cells, we all have them, you have them, uh, and they're there to protect you from autoimmunity. And so we asked a very simple question uh, a few years ago. Might it be possible uh, to harness these cells and hijack them and ask them to redirect their attention to prevent immunity to a transplant set of antigens? And this was work that started uh, when I was at the Hammersmith and it's involved uh, Giovanna, uh, who uh, Ed has already introduced. And the potential indications of this kind of therapy and not only in transplantation but also in inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. So what we did was tested this possibility in a mouse model which is where one often starts and sure enough in mice if you isolate these regulatory cells and then for example put on a CAR, a chimeric antigen receptor targeting them to the tumour, uh, we could show we could prevent transplant rejection in a mouse model. We then moved to get slightly closer to the clinic into what's called a humanized mouse, which is taking a mouse genetically engineered to have no immune system at all. And such a mouse will accept a piece of transplanted human tissue, and we used human skin provided by the plastic surgeon. So you transplant a piece of human skin onto this immuno-incompetent mouse, allow it to heal in for six weeks, and then six weeks later infuse into the animal human immune cells from another individual, which would reject the transplanted skin if le left unchecked. And then we also added regulatory cells to see if those regulatory cells uh, would be able to prevent the rejection. So you're looking here at a piece of human skin sitting happily at this point on this mouse and just injected with saline, it all looks fine. When you put in the human effector cells causing rejection, this green staining is showing damage to the keratinocyte layer in the skin transplant and this skin gets killed. If you put in regulatory cells at the same time, you can see you can completely inhibit that response. So this really doesn't look any different from the mouse that had no cells put in at all. So this was encouraging. Um, and so we have moved on then to make uh, human T cells with these CAR receptors. And the receptor we've used is shown here. It's targeting T cells to transplant antigens. And the data was sufficiently convincing uh, to persuade a venture fund, Syncona, to put 35 million into this spin-out company. Two of the scientific founders are in the audience, uh, Giovanna and Alberto. And this company is moving very fast to develop CAR T-reg therapy to use in liver transplant patients, I hope some of whom will be transplanted on this site. So the second territory um, is manipulating genes. I've talked about manipulating the immune system. What about manipulating genes for the benefit of patients? So the first area where this is now happening is gene therapy. Um, this particularly lends itself to dis diseases caused by single gene defects. And there are many of those. There's over 6,000 human diseases caused by single gene defects. They're rare diseases in their own right, but when you put them all together, this is quite a large disease burden. And the usual approach is to use, again, a viral vector to introduce a gene into a patient uh, who either has a non-functional gene or a bad copy of a gene. This has been applied in a number of clinical situations. It's been applied in the retin, and I'll come back to that. It's been applied in the spinal cord. It's been applied to children with severe immunodeficiency who would otherwise die. And indeed, there are some great clinical successes. Um, the retina lends itself to this because you can access the retina quite easily, as you can imagine, and actually inject the gene into the back of the eye. And there have been a large number of trials, some of which are ongoing, of gene therapy for genetically determined retinal diseases. Before I come back to that, another disease that lends itself to this are blood clotting disorders, such as haemophilia, where, again, you can put a good gene of a, for a clotting factor into the bone marrow of a patient that needs such therapy. Coming back to the retina, um, I'm very pleased to say that we've recently appointed 
uh, a very talented gene therapist called Robin Alley, uh, who's joining us from UCL, who was part of a group that defined this particular genetic defect causing one form of blindness, and then went on to do gene therapy uh, to treat this form of blindness. And I'm going to show you a video that illustrates the effectiveness of this gene therapy. Before therapy, this is an individual with this retinal disease due to the gene defect, trying to navigate his way through a maze under subdued lighting. He's got two people here assisting him, trying to avoid him injuring himself. And this is measuring the length of time it takes to get through the maze. And they're also recording the number of times that he bumps into things, which, as you can see, is quite substantial. Where he's trying to get to uh, is here. And eventually, with a little bit of guidance, uh, he finds his way. But it takes, in total, Seventy-seven seconds, and there are eight navigation errors. Six months after having the gene therapy, uh, he's given the same test. And by the way, he hasn't done this. He's not been practicing. This is the result of the therapy. Uh, and you can see uh, it's a completely transformed experience. Uh, and he navigates it really with very little difficulty in 14 seconds uh, without any navigation errors. So this is really an extraordinary achievement and uh, Robin of course has gone on to pursue other applications and we very much look forward to the work that he's going to do with us here. So gene editing, uh, as I started to mention, is replacing a bad copy of the gene with a good one. This was made possible by the discovery of a mechanism that bacteria use to defend themselves against viruses called CRISPR-Cas9. You may well have heard about it. It's a complex of an enzyme uh, which cleaves DNA, allowing new DNA to be inserted, and a sequence that targets that complex to the part of the genome that you wish to uh, fix. Um, it was discovered by two groups, one led by Jennifer Dowden in Berkeley and one led by Emmanuel Charpentier in Harvard. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that there's a running dispute between these two groups as to who owns the intellectual property. It's slightly unsavory but not entirely surprising. Um, because this has human, huge potential uh, in human therapy uh, to edit genes in, very, in a number of circumstances. One that's particularly attractive, which was on a previous slide, is haemoglobinopathies like thalassemia or sickle cell disease. Uh, and indeed, uh, clinical trials uh, have started uh, a year ago in Tennessee in sickle cell disease, and this is something that the Haematology Institute growing up on this site is very keen uh, to participate in moving forward. Third field is regenerative medicine. And that is allowing us to regenerate damaged tissues, or at least that is the hope. Now, you may well know that many long-term chronic diseases, particularly those associated with aging, are due to the unrecoverable loss of cells from tissues that cannot repair themselves. And that includes the heart, because your heart muscle cells cannot divide. So if you lose heart muscle cells, uh, then the best you can do is form a scar. Uh, neurons, now we're all losing neurons as we speak, as we get older, but that, of course, can be accelerated in dementia and Parkinson's, and you can't replace them. In the pancreas, if you lose beta cells, the ones that make insulin, you can't replace those. And in the retina, likewise. Uh, these are tissues that cannot repair themselves. Um, and so what I'm going to do is take the liberty of, of sharing with you some data uh, from uh, that's going on. Some of it's being generated right under your noses here because it's going on in the James Black Center. Uh, and it's led by a very talented clinical academic cardiologist, Mauro Jacker, who we recruited from Trieste and I think has crept in somewhere at the back of the uh, lecture theater. Um, and the approach that uh, Mauro is taking, instead of... Uh, using stem cells, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about stem cell therapy, which has been rather disappointing thus far. Uh, Mara's approach is to see if he can persuade cells that normally don't divide to divide using uh, microRNAs, these are small inhibitory RNAs, that alter patterns of gene expression. Now these are pictures of heart muscle cells, cardiomyocytes. They're elegant cells with this wonderful lattice 
uh, matrix of actin fibrin filaments that are responsible for these cells contracting and relaxing, which is why your heart, I hope, is beating as we speak, as I speak and as you listen. They're elegant cells, but here's your fact for the day. The cardiac myocytes that you have now are the ones you were born with. They don't divide. And you may say, well, why did my heart get bigger from when I was a baby to when I was an adult? The reason is because the muscle cells themselves get bigger. It's not that they've replicated. So these are very precious to you. And if you lose them, it is a problem. And the causes of, most causes of heart failure, which is a very unpleasant condition, is due to the loss of and the failure to replace uh, these heart muscle cells. So the holy grail uh, of heart failure when you lose heart muscle cells is to be able to persuade the surrounding tissue of a damaged area to regenerate and instead of forming a scar, which is what normally happens after a heart attack, for example, uh, to repair it with healthy tissue because a scar maintains the integrity of the heart wall but of course is useless in terms of pumping capability and when you have a myocardial infarction otherwise known as a heart attack you lose a few billion of those heart muscle cells so the approach that Mara has taken is to take libraries of microRNA mimics and test them individually on cultured heart muscle cells and see if any of these will trigger these heart muscle cells to start dividing and out of this large library, uh, he found a handful that looked promising, and he first tested those in a mouse model, and that was published in Nature in 2012, and indeed very convincing evidence that it did indeed what he hoped. But then he wanted to move closer to the clinic, and so moved towards an animal that, whose physiology more closely resembles that of the human, and that is the pig. And so the model was to induce a coronary uh, attack by blocking coronary artery in a, in a heart of a pig, and here you can see uh, this tissue, which is bulging a little bit here. This is the site of a heart attack in a pig due to blocking the coronary artery. And then immediately following that, injecting these microRNAs that showed promise in vitro to see if they would cause the heart to repair itself. And here's a video of the results. So you're looking now at an MR scan of a pig, and this is the heart here. The white is a dye in the ventricle of the heart. And so what you're going to watch is how well the heart pumps to exclude this uh, from that ventricle. Now, here's an animal that had a heart attack four weeks previously without uh, being injected with these microRNAs. And you can see, I think, without much difficulty, this is a pretty poorly performing pump. It's not excluding much of the dye. If you compare that with this one here, this was a treated animal, and you can see that it's pumping much more effectively, and likewise this one here. So, you measure this by measuring what's called the ejection fraction, and this was much more impressive than in the untreated animal. So this is extremely promising data, and in my view, this is the most exciting work going on in the field of regenerative medicine uh, that I know of anywhere in the world, and we're very excited to have it uh, here at King's. So how will all this work? Well, here's an image of uh, an elderly gentleman, I don't think this is Mara, I'm not sure who it is, emerging from having had a large... Uh, rich meal in a restaurant on a winter's night, carrying a heavy suitcase, cold weather, clutching his chest because he's got angina, risking a heart attack. Uh, if they're rapidly whisked by ambulance to somewhere with interventional cardiology expertise such as KCH, uh, then the microRNAs will get injected around the damaged site, leading to repair as opposed to a scar. That's the vision. Fourth theme, understanding the brain. I would suggest that the next decade or two are going to be the decades of the brain because it's beginning to reveal some of its secrets and that's due to a whole series of advances in technology and imaging. Um, so applying big data analysis to study the diversity of cells in the brain using single cell genomics is yielding some interesting insights. Being able to culture mini-brains, so this is culturing mini-brains from stem cells to study how the brain develops in more detail. Optogenetics is uh, introducing genes that are controlled by light, so you can turn genes on and off and study them in situ. Uh, neuropixels, this is getting massive parallel electrophysiological recordings from a thousand neurons at one time to understand how the brain works as a system. 
Genetic analysis is very interesting because the genes that confer risk of autism and those that confer risk of schizophrenia are rather closely overlapping, implying there's some similarity in the developmental abnormalities that lead to these two uh, distressing diseases. And then something that was completely unknown until recently, there's mosaicism in the brain. So we used to assume that all neurons had the same genome in the brain, at least I certainly did. But it turns out as they develop, they acquire mutations. And so how these neurons differentiate, differ from each other genetically is a very fertile field. And then using CRISPR to manipulate genes and study lineage. And one particular field that I'm, has become a personal passion of mine in the broad area of neuroscience, but it's linking neuroscience with immunity and inflammation, is the connection between the mind uh, and the body. This is a dynamic two-way relationship. And I'm embarrassed to say that when I was learning immunology as a PhD student, psychoneuroimmunology was a laughing matter. It was something that people did if they really couldn't think of anything better to do. I don't think it's a laughing matter anymore. I think it's a really fertile and important field. And I'll illustrate that in two ways. The first is a field referred to as bioelectronics. So you may have heard of the fact that you have an autonomous, ner autonomic nervous system. This is the part of your nervous system, for example, that controls your heart rate at rest. Um, but the autonomic nervous system also innovates your lymph nodes. And the vagus nerve is the kind of main trunk road of the autonomic nervous system, travels through the neck. And there are companies now that have designed little uh, gizmos that you can implant on the vagus nerve that give electric pulses to the vagus nerve. You can, can then control those pulses from your mobile phone. And those pulses control the release of inflammatory cytokines from your lymph nodes. So this now is being used as a treatment uh, for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, which are so sensitive to these inflammatory cytokines. Another set of data that I think is really fascinating uh, is emerged from across the road in the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, led by Carmine Parianti. And Carmine has been studying young adults who had severe emotional trauma in very early childhood, I mean, around the age of three. So as much as 20 years later, those young adults have amplified inflammatory responses due to that early trauma. That sounds very much like genetic imprinting that is affecting <coughs> their later lives. And on the right-hand side are two sets of data that come from a very interesting study by an American group who were looking at colonies of macaques, non-human primates, and these colonized colonies organized themselves into social hierarchies, as do humans, and they compared the macaques at the top of the pile and the bottom of the pile in terms of these hierarchies. And they provoked a, an inflammatory response, and what they found was that the macaques at the bottom of the pile had an exaggerated inflammatory response to those at the top of the pile, and then they looked at patterns of gene expression in an inflammatory cascade, and there was much more high level, there were much higher levels of gene expression in the macaques at the bottom of the pile compared to those at the top, who are the most dominant. If they compared genes unrelated to inflammation, there was no impact of that social hierarchy. Now, we've just had the release of the latest Marmot review, and Michael Marmot has quite rightfully highlighted the social determinants of health and pointing out that deprivation and poverty are bad for your health, and of course they are. It's a very important set of insights. But it's lazy to assume that that linkage is just due to bad lifestyle choices, increased smoking, increased drinking, increased obesity, more sedentary behavior. There's biology, I'm quite convinced of that. It's stressful to be at the bottom of the pile. It's stressful to be poor. And those that are in a more privileged and advantaged position uh, have a better deal. So this is really important, interesting biology. Penultimate uh, topic for you is imaging and artificial intelligence. And again, I showed this uh, slide in my uh, previous talk. Uh, this is diffusion spectrum imaging of the brain showing neural tracts. It's really elegant and beautiful. And it's allowing us to begin to understand the brain as a system. This is part of the Human Connectome Project. A key leader of that is uh, David Edwards working at St. Thomas's. And the ambition of this project is to provide a, a map a complete map of the structural and functional connections in the brain as a system, and I'm sure it'll yield uh, some really important insights. 
Here's another uh, set of data emerging from our own constituency. And this is the team, again, at St. Thomas's that Reza has led over the last decade. Um, and this is a study recently launched called iFind Intelligent Fetal Imaging and Diagnosis, um, getting really high resolution scans of fetuses midway through pregnancy. And one of the contributions of our uh, team here has been to allow motion compensation to get these kinds of quality of image because the fetus inconveniently is moving and it won't stop moving if you ask it to. And the fetal heart is beating at about 160 beats per minute. And if you want to get a good image of the heart, you need to compensate for that motion. Uh, and that's uh, achieved and that's why you get these lovely images. And this uh, Study involves combining ultrasound, magnetic resonance, robotics, and computer-aided di diagnostics. And one important application, for example, is getting much better diagnosis of fetal heart defects so that as soon as the baby's born, you've got the treatment, the surgery, whatever it is, lined up uh, for rapid access, which indeed is going to save many lives. Another aspect of imaging is uh, what I'm calling here teleophthalmology. So you're looking here at uh, a man in sub-Saharan Africa having a retinal scan, which is then transmitted by mobile phone and analyzed using a diagnostic algorithm, which will say, is there a retinal disease and say what it is or is this all right? Um, and you can see how powerful this is going to be in the remote African bush. But as I will argue in my next talk, I think this has got huge potential uh, to help us create a more sustainable healthcare system uh, in the UK also. So coupling this very sophisticated imaging, ever more sophisticated, uh, with artificial intelligence is where there's huge promise uh, allowing us to get smarter about diagnosis, smarter about personalization. And the final slide on imaging, this is uh, breast imaging using mammography. Uh, and Google Health has developed algorithms uh, for studying breast uh, mammograms and outperforms specialists in terms of specificity uh, and in terms of sensitivity. So it picks up lesions that otherwise would be missed and it avoids paying or intervening with lesions that need no intervention. So my final uh, topic is smart prevention and I had to include this because uh, in the last talk about the 10 advances, those who were there will remember around half of them were public health preventative interventions. Um, and I said that I think going forward, uh, again, major impacts have yet to come uh, from prevention and we need a greater focus on prevention, but we need smarter prevention. And the reason that's possible, I think, is because of the evolution uh, of polygenic risk scores. So uh, what we need to do with our preventive strategies is get much better at targeting the intervention to those that actually are going to benefit from it. Now, as you probably know, most uh, chronic diseases are polygenic in nature. The, the single gene disorders, as I said earlier, are rare diseases. Uh, and if you scan the whole of the genome, then you can come up with a polygenic risk score that takes account of all the genetic variations that lead to risk. And that allows you then to segregate the population according to risk. So um, if you take some of the major diseases, such as coronary artery disease, 8% um, of the population have an increased three times risk based on this polygenic risk score of that disease. 6% for atrial fibrillation, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, breast cancer. So you can see how helpful this will be in targeting interventions to those that are most going to benefit from it. Okay, so for the last few minutes, I'm going to switch to uh, the cautionary tales, as I'm calling them, things that have gone wrong uh, in research that we need to learn from and take account of as we move forward. And I'm going to cover fraud, I'm going to cover incorrect dogma, I'm not going to discuss unforeseen consequences, though it's an important topic, fashion and optimism bias, and finally ethics and regulation lagging behind discovery. So a couple of examples of fraud, and these are, these are unpleasant things to have to talk about, but it's important that we talk about them and indeed we learn from them. So. This was one uh, fraudulent set of data published uh, from a group led by Oba Carter, uh, who claimed to be able to reprogram mature somatic cells into embryonic stem cells uh, by exposure to acid or to stress. And so he put a gene, green fluorescent protein into these cells, put them into mouse embryos, and here's a green embryo showing 
he claimed that this uh, approach worked. It turned out to be fraudulent. You may remember Professor Huang in South Korea. He uh, claimed to be able to reprogram somatic cell nuclei by putting them into an egg cell. Now, slightly strangely, he got egg cells from one of his graduate students from a laparoscopic removal. Uh, doesn't sound very ethical. Um, and claimed to have this reprogramming working, which indeed, indeed was full of fraud. And when he was found out, he said, I was blinded by work and my drive for achievement. Now, a fraudulent event in my own field um, is legendary. Uh, it was work carried out by a young PI called Joseph Summerlin working in New York. He was interested um, in transplantation tolerance, uh, and he was transplanting skin from a black strain of a mouse onto a white strain of a mouse, as illustrated here. That's normally rejected. He was using a solution containing something we don't know what, which he claimed to make these skin grafts spontaneously accepted without immunosuppression. And he was working in a very high pressure group led by a guy called Bob Good. And he showed these mice in lab meetings uh, accepting these black grafts on a white mouse. The whistle was blown by an animal technician who found that with a little bit of alcohol, these black skin grafts turned white. Uh, he'd put white skin onto a white mouse and then used a black felt tip pen uh, to color them in. So this gave rise to the term painting the mouse to describe a fraudulent experiment. Now this connects with, but it's not quite the same as, the reproducibility crisis uh, that we uh, are living with now. This has been particularly prominent in the field of cancer, uh, but because my daughter's here, uh, she would agree it's also an issue in the field of psychology research. Too many too many. Uh, studies being published that others cannot reproduce. And this has been particularly a source of distress to pharmaceutical industries who scour the literature for interesting reports that might highlight a target that could be a target for a future drug development. But of course that data has to be sound, solid and reproducible. So in 2012, Amgen looked at 53 landmark studies in the field of cancer and tried to reproduce them and found only 11%, that was six out of the 53, they could reproduce. Very, very distressing. Uh, Bayer did a similar thing uh, with reports in cancer and cardiovascular research, and they took 67 studies, and they could only reproduce 24 of them, so 43 were irreproducible. This is appalling because it means that we're wasting time, money, human resource, uh, and it's bordering on deceptive. The reasons for the irreproducibility uh, it's selective reporting. It's, uh, every, those of you that generate data in the lab, you'll know how tempting it is to ignore the outlying data spots that don't fit your hypothesis. Um, pressure to publish, that's something we're all familiar with. Poorly designed studies that are not powered adequately statistically. A lab that's not comparing between individuals and what they're doing. Insufficient mentoring and so on. Now, that inappropriate or inadequate statistical design was well illustrated by a legendary study that was published by Bennett et al. in the Journal of Serendipitous and Unexpected Results. This was in the early days of functional MR scanning. Uh, when you're setting up your FMR, and FMR measures changes in blood flow uh, in tissues, particularly the brain. So if you're using a piece of the brain, then you can detect the use of that piece of the brain with FMR. So they wanted a control, you need a control tissue to analyze, and they tried various control tissues. They tried pumpkins, for example, but that wasn't giving enough uh, difference between the elements of a pumpkin, pumpkin. Someone had the bright idea of using a salmon. So they went to the local fishmonger and they got a dead Atlantic salmon. And the question was, would the brains of these salmons be able to display empathy if shown photographs of humans in distress? And the answer was yes. <laughs> and the answer was yes because when you do this kind of thing, you study a thousand voxels. These are, you know, parts of your image. And if you study enough things, enough times, you'll find something that's positive. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, so this was reported. Um, and of course, uh, uh, it was purely due to failure to correct for multiple comparisons. At the time, it's said that around a third of FMR studies were not correcting for multiple comparisons. and other they're running into the risk of these sorts of false positive. That fell quite quickly to 10%. Uh, 
because of the dead salmon experiment. Incorrect dogma. I'm going to tell you uh, a short story about incorrect dogma, which is, is the slight sort of therapeutic benefit for me in telling you this story, because I carry the scars of what I'm about to tell you. So uh, it's back to the field of transplantation tolerance. There seems something some to be particularly bad about this field of research. I, I don't know why. Um, but following the work of Peter Medawar, who was a Nobel Prize winning British immunologist, uh, who pioneered the field of transplantation tolerance in rodents, a number of uh, animal models evolved where you could establish tolerance to one tissue from one strain uh, in another strain via some immune manipulation. And indeed, my own PhD involved one such model. What then emerged was that once you've established this tolerance state, so a B strain animal tolerant to an A strain graft, often you could transfer the tolerance with a population of T cells that I've talked about before, actually CD4 cells, into a naive animal, and those transferred T cells will serve to protect a graft, a challenge graft, from the same strain to which the T cell donor was tolerant. So this is specific tolerance being transferred by T cells. What that tells you is the tolerance state, once it evolves, is actively maintained by a population of T cells. Those then became called suppressor cells, for obvious reasons. They were suppressing the rejection res response. And so a number of labs in the States in particular, but there was one prominent one also in Europe, started studying these suppressor cells. And in order to study them, what they did was they fused them with a, a tumor cell line to immortalize these suppressor cells so they could grow them up in large numbers and characterize them in detail. And there evolved a Baroque cascade of suppressor cells called TS1s, T-suppressor 1, leading to T-suppressor 2, leading to T-suppressor 3, which then mediated the suppressive effect. And I remember when I was flying over to the States to do my postdoc, I read this very review and I saw this very image and I tried to understand it all and internalize it all so I could uh, impress my new lab chief, Ron Germain, who was one of the people who'd worked in this territory, uh, that I understood it. Now, these suppressor hybridomas, some of them made factors, soluble factors, that bound to antigen. That means they must have had an antigen-specific receptor. Others of them made a class II molecule for the cognoscenti called IJ. So the project I was given when I first went to the NIH as a postdoc was to subject these suppressor hybridomas, and we collected a panel of them from around the world, to a molecular analysis to look at their T cell receptor genes to see how they bound antigen, to look at their class II region to see what their IJ looked like. And to cut the story short, it turned out that most of them had not rearranged their T-cell receptor genes at all, so they couldn't be binding antigen. And the IJ region simply wasn't there. It wasn't, it's not that it wasn't there in the hybridomas, it, wasn't, it doesn't exist. It simply doesn't exist. And so this basically turned out to be one enormous artifact. And the saddest part of the story, and that's where I do need your emotional support, is that Ron Germain would not allow me to publish this. I've got a beautiful data set, but he was so concerned about offending his godfather, Baruch Benassaraf, who, by the way, was a Nobel Prize winner, not for this work, but for other work that he did. So these data had substantially good credentials, but were based on a set of dogma that somehow reproduced itself and was one big artifact. And I don't know if anybody has quite worked out how that whole literature evolved, but if you go back in time, it's the late 70s, early 80s, uh, you'll find it. Fashion and optimism bias is another concern. And you, if you look at the literature, the scientific literature, you'll see waves of fashion. Things suddenly become fashionable and everybody piles in. And one field where that has definitely been a problem, I would say, is in the field of stem cell research. When it became possible to isolate stem cells from bone marrow or embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, they were used to treat everything, anything that moved. So macular degeneration, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, even erectile dysfunction, critical limb ischemia, myocardial infarcts, and the results have been largely disappointing, as I've already told you. Where would you turn today to look at the risk of fashion? Well, I wonder about the microbiome. I'm sure you've heard of the microbiome. You may know your second fact for the day. You've got more bacteria in your gut than you have cells in your body. So we live in leaf, peace, love, and harmony most of the time with our microbiome. There's a microbiome on your skin. There's a microbiome in the mouth being studied uh, by Mike Curtis and colleagues in our faculty of dentistry. Um, 
Now, this is the number of papers published on the microbiome from year 2008 up until 2017. You can see this is a fashionable area, and that should raise alarm bells. Now, I should add, I'm convinced that there is important biology in how the microbiome influences human physiology and indeed may well influence some diseases. But the number of people now piling into this uh, is a source of some concern. And then finally, um, trailing ethics and regulation. So challenges arise when science moves faster than public approval does. And a good example of that is back to CRISPR, because you may remember about a year ago, Professor He in China um, genetically engineered embryos of twins modifying their CCR5 gene, which is involved in HIV infection, to protect them from subsequent HIV infection. He did this, and I think he announced it to the world, expecting great plaudits. In fact, he got enormous disapproval because this simply wasn't keeping up with uh, ethical discussion and regulation and set the field back. Now, the GM crops thing is another area where I think we weren't, we weren't careful enough about bringing the public with us, uh, and it's now a matter of catch up. In contrast, I think the way the UK has handled mitochondrial transfer, and that's the three parent baby story you may have read about in the press, where you take mothers with inherited mitochondrial diseases and you replace the mitochondrian embryo with healthy mitochondria. That's been absolutely approved of by the public and again proved very successful. And it's worth noting that smart regulation is something we're really good at in the UK. In fact, we're internationally respected for our intelligent pragmatism in this kind of field. And when I do, as I have been over the last three years, search for a positive dividend of Brexit, here is one that maybe we can position ourselves uh, as the go-to place for advanced therapeutics. Some of the kinds of therapies I've been talking about by being really on the front foot and coming up with regulatory regimes uh, that allow this to happen, what I refer to as the agility dividend of Brexit. So what does all this mean? Well, what it means is if we don't address these sorts of issues, then we're going to fall victim to what is referred to provocatively by some people who really specialise in this topic as research waste. Uh, and there's a guy called Chalmers, for example, who talks about this a lot. They're not really friends of our community because I think they're giving the whole field a bad name, and I think that's unfair. But nonetheless, waste in research does happen. It happens if the questions we're addressing are not important questions and relevant questions. It happens if our methodologies are inappropriate and inadequate. It happens uh, if our publication strategies are inappropriate and we're only publishing positive results, not all the results. It's a problem if we're subject to bias and fashion. So my final slide. Um, I think it's really, really important that we learn from these lessons and, and anecdotes that I've been describing to you and address the reproducibility challenge uh, in the ways that I've said. Uh, make sure that our research is as transparent as possible. We want an open research culture, open notebooks, so that no one's hiding their results in the lab open peer review, open data so others can access the data and study it, open access publishing. Um, we need to ensure that we bring the public with us, that we need the public's permission to do what we do. We need to be efficient so we're making good use of research resource. I don't know if you followed the budget today, the government has recommitted to doubling the research spend in the UK. That is absolutely fantastic, but we have to justify it by spending that money well. And synergy refers to the need to collaborate uh, across groups and not allow competition to obstruct progress. I think if we go those things, if we address those issues, given the rate of discovery I've described, then I think there's some really exciting times ahead. Thank you very much.